Good morning, it's time to begin. We may be few, but we are mighty. Be because we are threshers. Today we have the privilege of hearing three speakers for the C. Henry Smith Peace Oratorical Contest final round. And to introduce the event and our speakers, <clears throat> Here is junior psychology major and KIPP Corps intern, Vanessa Torres. Hi everyone, so I am Vanessa, and for today's combo is the final round of the C. Henry Smith Peace Oratorical Contest. To give you a bit more history on this contest, in 1974, the directors of the C. Henry Smith Trust established a peace oratorical contest in the name of the late C. Henry Smith. C. Henry Smith was a Mennonite historian and professor at Bethel and its sister institutions, Goshen College and Bluffton College. Smith had a deep interest in the Mennonite peace position, so the directors of the trust felt that an oratorical contest would be a fitting way to foster continuing thought about contemporary peace issues. The C. Henry Smith Oratorical Contest, administered by the Peace and Justice Ministries of the Mennonite, sorry, <laughs> of the Mennonite Central Committee U.S. is held once a year. Every Mennonite and Brethren in Christ College in North America is eligible to participate. Each participating college holds a contest on campus with speeches presented by students on the general theme of the application of a Christian peace position to contemporary concerns with prize money available to the winners. The winning speech from each college is then judged by three judges cho chosen by Peace and Justice Ministries. The speeches are ranked on their topic, content, delivery, introduction, conclusion, and creativity in order to establish a final winner. So for today, we will hear the finals of the 2022 Bethel Contest orations from Nat Natalie Graber, Josue Kaldig, and John Kuntz. These three orations will be evaluated by our three judges, Heidi Hoskinson, VP of Enrollment here at Bethel, Larry Lee, pastor at All Nation Church in Newton, and Eric Masonari, chaplain at Kindred Bethel Village. These three judges will select a winner who will receive a cash prize for winning the Bethel contest and will record their presentation for submission to the Binational Contest. Last year's Bethel winner, Allison Weaver, won the Binational Contest as well. We hope to hear, repeat this trend this year. There will be time for Q&A after all of the presenters have completed their presentations. And now I'm going to let Eva Lamp make a quick announcement. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so before we dive into the presentations, we also want to remind seniors that Bethel College participates in the National Graduation Pledge of Social and Environmental Responsibility, which you should have already received an email about. So just to remind you, graduating seniors may, if you wish, sign a pledge stating that you will explore and take into account the social and environmental consequences of any job you consider, and you will try to improve these aspects of any organization for which you work. The goal of the pledge is to remind each of you that no matter where your career path takes you, you can always give back to society and you can always find a career that fits your values. Seniors who sign the pledge will be presented with a green ribbon to wear on your robes during the graduation ceremony. So if you are a graduating senior and you want to sign this pledge, you can sign the poster board inside the Thresher Shop anytime until Sunday, May 15. And if you have questions about the pledge, you can contact some of us at KIPP Corps and we can tell you more about it. All right, back to Vanessa. So back to today's contest, first we'll hear from senior Nat Natalie Graber, a natural science and psychology double major. Natalie will be presenting an oration titled, Peace Begins in Our Hearts, The Ripple Effects of Small-Scale Peacemaking Habits. Ooh. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, it's delightful to be here with you this morning. Um, again, my name is Natalie Graber, and the title of my oration is Peace Begins in Our Hearts, The Ripple Effects of Small-Scale Peacemaking Habits. Throughout this school year, we've begun chapel services with a litany of peace derived from Taoist philosopher Lao Tzu's writing on virtue. It goes like this. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. And if there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Each time I listened to this litany, I found myself thinking about a different level of peace mentioned. It's offered me a framework for thinking about the ways which we can interact with peace on these different levels and spread its ripple effects through the actions in our everyday lives. The litany begins with peace in the heart, or also known as intrapersonal peace, peace inside oneself. Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter, Reverend Mumfo Tutu, wrote a book titled The Book of Forgiving which explores their idea of the fourfold path to offering and recognizing the need for forgiveness. This process begins with awareness from within us and then the opening of our hearts to the potential for forgiveness. The tutus note that our brains process physical pain and emotional pain in the same way. That is to say, it does not distinguish one form of pain from the other. Therefore, even the smallest of comments that we refuse to admit hurt us do just that. When we are hurt, we must know that we are also capable of turning around and hurting, something the tutus label as the revenge cycle. When we fail to seek out the solutions to our lack of intrapersonal peace, we can be led to conflict with those around us. The tutus emphasize that opening our hearts to forgiveness from our hurt is not easy, but a necessity in releasing burdens and healing in a way that propels us forward. For us, creating peace in the heart might look like practicing having awareness of the things that are heavy on our hearts and hinder our ability to share peace or engage in forgiveness. Taking what we know about intrapersonal peace leads us to thinking more about peace in the home and between neighbors, the people that we most closely interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. While community peacemaking can feel small, it becomes a habit-forming practice that shapes our commitments and in turn shapes our witness to the world. Corey Miller, a pastor at Salem Zion Mennonite Church in Freeman, South Dakota, spoke in a recent chapel service about Jesus being challenged by the Pharisees about the fate of the woman caught in adultery. Miller explained Jesus' actions in this story as Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. While this act has perplexed many who read it, Miller explained this decision by Jesus in a way I had never considered before. He hypothesized that Jesus stopped, bent down, and drew in the sand to defer attention away from the woman, as this was a tense moment where the woman was facing a very public death sentence. But after some time, Jesus stood up and gave one of his well-known proclamations. Let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. Sometimes we act impulsively in the face of conflict because we want to instantly fix the existing problem. Miller argued that we all too need to slow down in our time of conflict sometimes and let the creative side of our brains take over, much like how Jesus did. This is something we can practice in our everyday lives, in our homes and with our neighbors, the people that we interact with the most. For us, creating peace in the home might look like practicing Jesus' outside-the-box thinking to find solutions to our everyday quarrels. And for us, creating peace between neighbors might look like following the example of communities in Nebraska who invite refugee families into their neighborhoods, as highlighted in the documentary A Home Called Nebraska. On a slightly larger scale, we look at peace in the cities and the ways we, as a broader community of believers, witness our peacemaking views to those on the outside looking in. Jordan Farrell, pastor at Beth El Mennonite Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, views peace in this way. Quote, peace does not simply mean the absence of physical conflict. Instead, they describe physical, social, moral, and spiritual wholeness and well-being for all people. Peace describes a world in which all people have what they need in order to be well and whole, end quote. 
This has shaped Bethel's engagement with holistic peacemaking, resulting in numerous programs intertwined with the community surrounding Bethel. Something that I have noticed at Bethel is the grace and warm embrace they offer people who don't specifically claim to be Mennonites. Pharrell sees it in this way. Quote, when I engage in peacemaking with people who have different beliefs than I do, the thing I focus on the most is the interconnectedness of God's shalom. End quote. Pharrell further expresses that the interconnectedness of our physical bodies and spirits allows for the whole engagement of peacemaking as discipleship. When we surround ourselves with these peacemaking practices on a community level, we can be better equipped to approach larger extensions of building peace. For us, creating peace in the cities might look like supporting organizations like Raw Tools that disarms guns and forges them into gardening tools. Raw Tools seeks to end gun violence one gun at a time and make communities safer for everyone while also advocating for restorative justice practices to be used while doing so. When considering the bigger picture of creating peace in the nations and the world, we can apply themes from smaller scale peace building with an additional understanding that working abroad needs to be approached thoughtfully and carefully. Within Mennonite Central Committee, the SALT Serving and Learning Together program is a year-long immersive cross-cultural program that allows participants to engage in service and community throughout their placement. Randall Schmidt, a participant in 2019 and 2020, reflected on his initial interest, stating, quote, I wanted to participate in a program that was led by local organizations and worked with, Mennonite, with the Mennonite lens of service and without the idea of proselytizing." end quote. It is important to enter into a community with open ears and open hearts in order to ensure we listen to the needs that are expressed rather than pushing individual agendas. Additionally, the ways in which we frame the concept of serving abroad in our Western culture has impacted the approaches taken, with many not being very sustainable. Schmidt comments on this by saying, quote, we are kind of conditioned to see the U.S. and Western world as developed and everywhere else as non-developed and needing our help, when that is so very far from the truth, end quote. While not everyone has the ability to go abroad and build peace in this way, we can still actively participate in change through sharing our resources. Schmidt explains, quote, most times people in the communities know and have the capacity to make it happen. However, finances are most often the stumbling block, end quote. Supporting organizations that work within these communities allows for the creation of community-driven establishments in an ethical and sustainable way. For us, creating peace in the nations and world might look like the 70 comforters made in honor of the 70th birthday of Bill and Esther Esch. Bill, Esther, family, and friends gathered one weekend to tithe 70 comforters to be sent across the world by MCC, a decision to give rather than to get. These are the levels of which we can interact with peace every day. We need to relearn how to create peace at all levels in order to have a more peaceful world. The peace that we seek to have in the world is possible and not far removed from us. In fact, it is very near. Our hearts within us are a cup that holds peace, which is replenished by God, so that we can nourish ourselves with peace and everyone else we encounter. Because when there can be peace in the heart, there can be peace in the home. And when there can be peace in the home, there can be peace in the heart. Or sorry, when there can be peace in the home, there can be peace between neighbors. When there can be peace between neighbors, there can be peace in the cities. When there can be peace in the cities, there can be peace in the nations. And when there can be peace in the nations, there can be peace in the world. Thank you, Natalie. Now we'll hear from our first year, Jose Kaudik, tentatively double majoring in social work and Bible and religion. Jose will be presenting an oration titled Moses the Two World Peace Builder. My name is Jose Kaudik. The title of my oration is Moses, the Two-World Peace Builder. 
Today, as always, there are people who belong to oppressive empires, people who are part of marginalized communities, and people who somehow grow up in both. What does it mean to be a peace builder for those of us in that last category? Moses, the prophet of the Exodus, who walked and sometimes stumbled with one foot in each of two worlds, offers us a vision for how we can be peace builders, not through our own will or testimony, but by being a bridge between opposing worlds through our understanding of each. Moses grew up as an Israelite in Pharaoh's palace with many of the privileges of being an Egyptian, but he was also nursed by his Israelite mother. In Acts 7.22, Luke depicts Moses as powerful in his speech and action. As the grandson of Pharaoh, he had an intimate understanding of how the system worked. At the same time, he saw the suffering and marginalization of his family, and though it wasn't his own experience, he felt their pain and was angered by their unjust treatment. One day, when Moses saw an Egyptian guard abuse a fellow Israelite, out of this volatile mix of power and pain, he took it upon himself to defend and avenge the Israelite by murdering the guard. Many Two World folks today understand Moses' temptation to try and protect his people through the power given to him as a member of Pharaoh's empire. But after the murder, Moses wasn't just exiled by the Egyptians, he was also rejected by the Israelites who were afraid both of suffering the consequences of his rage and of becoming its next targets. When two world folks today insult or undermine the establishment, supposedly out of solidarity with the oppressed or because we believe we are marginalized ourselves, are we just exercising our power as members of an oppressive system while doing little to bring about constructive change? Moses' early attempts at justice were not limited to the Egyptian. Exodus 2 verses 13 and 14 tell us that the day after killing the guard, Moses also tried to stop a fight between two Israelites. One of them turned to him and asked, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me like you killed the Egyptian? When we have two worlds by the lie, that our, when we have two worlds by the lie that our privilege equates to moral authority, an attempt to correct and direct our Israelite siblings, are we falling like Moses into the trap of serving as ruler and judge? While Moses' anger showed a deep and essential caring for the oppressed, his rage and impulsive actions were neither effective nor God's way. So Moses was sent into exile to learn to be a shepherd. Moses like two world folks today, had to develop the essential skills of patience, keen observation, steadfast commitment, and a quiet but powerful courage before he could be called to be a peace builder and liberator. Still, when God did come calling, Moses resisted. He told God he would not be good at speaking on behalf of the Israelites or with the Egyptians. He was of two worlds, and belonging to and speaking with either would be difficult since both would see him as an outsider. But God reminded Moses that the people were suffering and that he had a responsibility to help the Israelites and contribute in his own way as a person of two worlds, to their struggle for peace and justice. God also reminded Moses that, God also told Moses that Aaron, his older Israelite brother, who'd grown up as a slave in Egypt, would speak for him. So, eventually, Moses agreed to return and lead God's people out of Israel, out of Egypt. 
It can be intimidating for two world folks like me to try to communicate with and engage a community we feel we should be a part of, but into which we can't quite fit. Sometimes it's a language barrier, sometimes it's cultural differences, but most fundamentally, it's a difference in power. When we try to speak to Pharaoh, he might let us through the door, but he never forgets that we are Israelites, and in some ways he manages to discount and disrespect us as such. When we speak to the Israelites, they see the grandsons and stepsons of Pharaoh and don't entirely trust us. Nevertheless, the story of Moses inspires us to engage in the struggle and to recognize that the gift of being of two worlds is not the ability to communicate as one to the other, but the way we can become a bridge and a platform for dialogue between two distinct and often hostile worlds. Once in Egypt, the brothers consulted the Israelites and their elders and went with them not instead of them, to speak to Pharaoh. Sent by and in representation of God, Moses supported and inspired the Israelite people, working side by side with his brother and the Israelites as they demonstrated God's power and made their demands before Pharaoh. Moses respected the authority and power of the Israelites as he stood with them. He was not, however, just an idle observer. He listened, he inspired and cajoled, he helped strategize and organize. He was an active agent and brought careful observation and knowledge of the system that oppressed the Israelites. With assistance from God, he offered an energized and courageous faith, arguing powerfully that with persistence, the uprising could be successful. Moses, like two world folks today, had to remember that the Israelite slaves had the right to speak and guide the process in the work of peace building. We of two worlds may suffer some, and we certainly know what suffering looks like, but we aren't truly oppressed so long as our privilege gains us entry into the palace. When we forget this, we start talking as though the experience of disempowered and marginalized people were our own, and we must recognize, but we must recognize that that space belongs to the Israelites who were in fact slaves in Egypt. We two worlders cannot claim stories that are not and never will be ours. Thus does Moses give us two world peace builders guidance for what our place in peace building might look like. As a two-worlder with a Kekchi Guatemalan father and a Mennonite American mother, Moses' story speaks to my role within Mennonite institutions as they struggle to transform their very imperfect relationships with black, indigenous, and other communities of color in the U.S. and around the world who today constitute the majority of their members. Moses inspires me as a person of two worlds to find meaningful ways in which I can stand with those marginalized by the church and also challenge those same Mennonite institutions that may embrace me but often fail to see all of who I am and refuse the people I would bring with me. It is my responsibility as it was for Moses to work with those clamoring to create new spaces for previously marginalized voices, and to ensure through my Mennonite bloodline that when they do, Pharaoh has no choice but to listen. Thank you. Thanks, Wasoy. And finally, we hear from first year John Koons, a music education major. John will be presenting an oration titled Music and Peace Building Bridging the Divide Between dif Different Cultures.
My name is John Kuntz, and the title of my speech is Music and Peace Building, Bridging the Gap Between Different Cultures. Music has always been something that's made sense to me. I've always loved singing, playing instruments, whether it be the classic rock my dad would show me as a kid, or just playing violin and classical orchestras and the music that I was exposed to there. But it's not just me, a Midwestern Mennonite, who is enthralled by this subject that no one can explain and put a concrete meaning to. All different cultures have embraced music in their own unique way, whether it be the rhythms of Fela Kuti's Afrobeat in Nigeria, the sitar of Ravi Shankar in India, or the masses written by Johann Sebastian Bach in Germany. Music affects us all, and it is an essential part of how we communicate with one another. No matter what background you come from, music unites people towards a goal of making something truly great that, it, that trans, transcends the space. But often the music of marginalized cultures is distorted or rep, misrepresented by the dominant culture. In addition, the faculty at mostly white colleges are, predom are predominantly white. According to the Higher Education Arts Data Services, from 2015-2016, 85.4 percent of college music professors are white. Bethel College and other institutions that require students to study peace, justice, and conflict studies are no exception to this. We as Christians use music every week in our services by singing hymns. So our role as Christian peacemakers should be to foster environments where we can value and perform the music of other cultures in a way that empowers those cultures. Today, I will be discussing the ways in which different cultures play a part in choral, orchestral, and jazz music, and I'll explore how those in power can be more inclusive and accepting of more diverse musical groups while performing their music. In choral music, there is music from the Western traditions in the modern classical and Baroque eras, which makes up most of the music many majority white American choirs sing, including the Bethel College Concert Choir. Eric Whitaker, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Johann Sebastian Bach are prominent composers from each of these eras. But there is much more to sing about than just the works of white composers. It is a good thing to diversify our repertoire, but singing African American spirituals brings up the issue of a mostly white choir singing about issues like slavery. One of the concert choir songs, Hold On, arranged by Moses Hogan, was sung without context to what was going on in the lyrics despite the song telling the story of slavery and how African Americans would speak in code to keep themselves on the right track. When I heard the piece, I was fascinated by its driving notes and rhythms, but I was confused when dialect was sung without any explanation. Now that I have presented some of the issues that affect choral music, I'd like to move on to some of the issues surrounding orchestral music. Classical orchestral music, many of the same white composers from choral music dominate the field. Bach, Mozart, Joseph Haydn, and Johannes Brahms, to name a few. But the black, Latinx, and Asian orchestra composers get little to no recognition as being musical leaders. This is one of the drawbacks of the way orchestral music is performed today by mostly predominantly white orchestras. How can it how can classical music remain relevant to listeners in the 21st century when most of its recognized composers are white Europeans from 300 years ago? There are cultural issues with both choral and classical orchestra music, but there are also issues to be discussed within the genre of jazz music. Now, I think jazz music kind of has interesting ties to being an Anabaptist because in jazz, you are working with the melody. You're working with the form of the tune. You know what's going on, but yet you're making something new from it. Just like the Anabaptists um, were trying to make something new out of their religion by saying, we think faith is more meaningful when you're baptized as an adult, rather as an infant. So this is sort of a genre that I think could have some ties to the Anabaptist tradition. But jazz is a genre that has historically from the African American community. The most famous works in this genre performed by, primar by primarily white ensembles come from a myriad of African American composers and artists such as Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, and John Coltrane. 
but despite the music being historically rooted with African Americans, most of the young musicians receiving a jazz education in universities and conservatories are white. If you look across the bands of prominent programs like the University of North Texas, the Eastman School of Music, or even the Juilliard School of Music, you will see mostly white students. According to datausa.io, in 2019, the Juilliard School of Music offered degrees to white students at a rate of 2.69 times higher than that of the next closest race. Despite the many cultural issues that are occurring within music today, there are several solutions that could be implemented to help mitigate the negative effects of cultural appropriation, misrepresentation, or a lack of diversity. Within a choral context, conversations need to be had in order to understand the history and context of the music. Choral music communicates a story, and it is especially important to know what story is being told when it is from a culture that is less privileged. The audience should also be informed of the history and context of the piece, and that can be achieved either through program notes or making an announcement right before the piece is sung. Taking the extra time to address this makes for a greater chance of equity within the choir. Now that I've discussed possible solutions for cultural appropriation within choral settings, I would like to mention some potential solutions for how to work at being more culturally diverse and accepting within the orchestral music setting. When planning your orchestral programs, be sure to include a wide variety of composers from different cultural backgrounds. Tell your students a little bit about who they are, what their pieces meant within the context of the time period. Similar to the choral context, it is good to make sure that the audience is informed about the pieces as well. Who is this lesser known composer? Why are their works important? In addition to classical music, there are also solutions to be considered within the world of jazz. The people who control and who can attend and participate in jazz programs should work towards supporting people of all races and backgrounds in pursuing jazz and all other forms of art. For educators, it would be beneficial to start an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion within your program so that more people have a chance of benefiting from what you have to offer. Teach how artists of color were trailblazers in jazz by pioneering styles such as bebop and cool jazz rather than just saying nothing and assuming that these are just the composers, this is the work they did. Others could give financial support to the arts programs near you, whether they are affiliated with a school or not. These programs play a crucial role in getting students started at a young age, and financial support helps provide quality instruments and educators that will get students engaged. There are ways to be more inclusive in music environments. It just takes intentional conversations and people willing to make changes. We as Christians should be called to this work because Psalm 150 states that we should praise the Lord using strings, dance, trumpet sounds, and all types of music. Christians like me, who claim to value peace and justice, should begin to make our music and music institutions more equitable and just for everyone. Thanks, John, and thank you all. Now can we get another round of applause for these candidates? <laughs> Our judges will now take some time to deliberate, and KIPCOR will email the community later today announcing our winner. Now we have some time for Q&A, and if you have questions for these presenters, you may go ahead.
All right. So uh, I, I don't know. Either one, can either one of you answer? Uh, what was the process of creating these orations like? Um, just a short, you know, how it worked, how, what, you, what was going through y'all's heads when you were making it? Um, let's see, I guess for me, I never really thought I would be able to get up here and do something like this. Um, my public speaking skills have been terrible my whole life, honestly. And so um, kind of getting the confidence to actually stand up here and write something and do it, um, I think I decided to frame my uh, oration on the litany of peace because it was something that I heard weekly um, in chapel and it was just kind of one of those uh, things that was stirring a lot of thoughts inside me and so I just decided to put them on a piece of paper and kind of that it kind of flowed together from there yeah uh, for me I think it, it started I had a, a vague idea of something I, I wanted to, an idea that was bothering me that I had uh, that I wanted to process, and as I worked through this oration, um, it was a process of crystallizing that idea, the, the idea of Moses as a two-world peace builder. Uh, and through, that, through the process of writing this oration, um, yeah, I learned a lot about, about what I shared in the oration, so it was, a, it was uh, I enjoyed the process. I kind of saw this as a way to bring together two things that I'm really interested in. I've always been a musician, but then kind of looking into what that music means within a broader context as far as social justice and, and peace and just kind of lo looking how it affects m multiple different people and how we can create better environments for art to thrive. So that was kind of my process behind this. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for coming. You are dismissed.